We mentioned uh, the, that there's a great significance to Hebron, <coughs> uh, to Abraham, and to the story of, of Abraham. And um, uh, Jason Main was sharing with me last night and um, shared some really good things. And when we get to that point, I may have you mention a couple of things that you saw because they were good. Um, but, um, but he said something about, sorry, he skipped ahead. Well, y'all, unless I tell you don't skip ahead or like sometimes I like reading something to you and letting you listen to it and then you can go back and look at it maybe in your own time or maybe right after that. <clears throat> but for the most part, I do think it's a good idea to move on just ahead or as far as you want uh, in the book of Genesis or in any sharing that I'm doing because <clears throat> it gives you a familiarity with the scriptures and maybe if uh, the Lord should share something um, within those that you didn't see, it would mean more to you because you have that, those scriptures as a landing strip. So anyway, so just to show the significance here, you, yes, you should keep your place in Genesis 13, um, but also turn now to Genesis 23 because we're going to just show some of the scriptures that show the significance <clears throat> of Hebron. I think I ended the class last week, which was class number 13, <clears throat> with uh, that the word Hebron means fellowship, fellowship. <clears throat> Genesis 23, and we'll read verse 2 through 4. And Sarah died in Kirjath Arba, the same as Hebron, in the land of Canaan. And Abram came to mourn for Sarah and to weep for her. And, um, and Abraham stood up from before his dead and spake unto the sons of Heth, saying, I am a stranger and a sojourner with you. Give me a possession for a burying place with you, that I may bury my dead out of my sight. And then uh, verse, starting with verse 16, 16 through 20, And Abraham hearkened unto Ephron, and Abraham weighed to Ephron the silver which he had named in the audience of the sons of Heth, 400 shekels of silver, current money with the merchant. And the field of Ephron, which was Machpelah, which was before Mamre, Mamre, the field and the cave which was therein, and all the trees that were in the field, that were in all the borders round about were made sure. Verse 18, unto Abra Abraham for a possession in the presence of the children of Heth, buried uh, before all that went in at the gate of, of his city. And after this, Abram buried Sarah, his wife, in the cave of the field of Machpelah before Mamre the same as Hebron in the land of Canaan and the field and the cave that is therein were made sure unto Abraham for a possession of a burying place for the sons of, of Heth. <clears throat> and so um, uh, we got the first glimpses of Hebron in chapter 13 right after Lot had left. Do you remember that? Lot had left. And, and God immediately, it says, immediately after Lot left, God spoke to Abram and began to spell out the program more and more of what was in his heart and to communicate more to Abram what was going on. And it says that he, he moved to Hebron. And that was this same place here we're reading, you know, many years later. Um, and involved basically the same people. And the, the story will build from that point to this point in relationship to the people from whom he bought it from and some of the relationships. Um, but here <coughs> we have um, just just 
moments before he leaves, goes to Hebron and builds an altar. All of those, God speaking, he leaves. Lot's out of the picture as far as being the firstborn. And, and he's building an altar. <clears throat> this, uh, these, um, the words of the Lord were to Abram that you are now the possessor of the land. Okay. All right. So you're the possessor of the land. But here in these scriptures, <clears throat> even though God had declared that to him, uh, when he comes before the inhabitants of the land, what we just read, when he comes before the inhabitants of the land that are at Hebron, he declares himself to be a stranger and a sojourner, a, a, not a possessor, not a controller, not someone who's heard from God and bless God, I know what I'm doing and I'm going to fight for what God has told me. You know, we always want to fight for God. Or, or are we fighting for our possession instead of, if, you know, come on. If God tells you something and he says, well, I, I'm going to do this for you, give you that, do you really have to fight? I mean, can't you just go, well, I think that, you know, he's able to do that. But, oh, no, you know, Goliath showed up, you know. And, I mean, he was big compared to Israel, but, I mean, he wasn't big compared to God, you know. <clears throat> so there is this, um, this spirit. He says, I'm a, I'm a stranger here. He doesn't even say, I'm one of the inhabitants of the land. He certainly doesn't say, I'm the possessor of everything around that you're standing on right now. And, um, <clears throat> and he also gives them money. He saw that. He gives them money for what basically almighty God had declared, I give this to you. But he gave them money. And um, uh, I wrote down, he does not fight for it. Hebron is the place that he appeared to take possession of any of the promised land, meaning through this method, what I would say through the lamb spirit, through the spirit of the lamb, he took possession of that. Now, isn't that interesting that that's the first part of the land he's got? It's Hebron, and it's a word of death. Yeah. It's the burying place. It's this, it's this spirit. It's this thing. And, and um, what if, <clears throat> just, you know, hypothetical. What if everything God promised you, it was a promise until you possessed it by the Lamb? Think about it. You see what I'm saying in this story? He actually possessed it by the lamb, uh, and it remained his forever, and, and his sons and his grandsons and great-grandchildren. Um, that we hear God say, okay, well, this is yours, and um, so we go, okay, well, it's mine. But there's no death. There's no selfless giving. There's only selfish taking. Well, God said, you know, and, that, and then it's, it's mine and you shouldn't, you know. Uh, and, uh, but what if everything that he ever said, you know, anybody ever had a word from the Lord through somebody at a church service or something like that? Anybody ever had that before? We have two, thank God. We've got uh, at least two holdovers from the charismatic movement. <laughs> I, I'm pretty sure we all have, just about. <clears throat> and, um, and I've, you know, over the years, being a pastor, I've had so many people come to me and say, well, you know, the Lord said to me this and that, and I, you know, when is that going to happen? Because it looks like it's getting worse. And, you know, but, and again, hypothetical. What if... What if the Lord wanted us to possess that by the Spirit of the Lamb instead of taking it or instead of claiming it or naming and claiming it? 
and that sort of spirit. And so um, he takes this part of the inheritance and he makes it a place of death. That's where they're all going to be buried. So anyway, you shared some things about the sons of Heth and a couple other things. you mind sharing that with us? Yeah. Why don't you come up here and just... Now, if you go over 20 minutes, I'm going to have to... <laughs> How gone you were. Oh, well, you know, I, I was just reading that place never... Randy said that Hebron was uh, Hebron was the place where they would all be buried. I just, you know, skipped over to that part just to, you know, read it for myself and see how he came about, you know, choosing this place to be the burial place. And uh, you know, it it the Lord just really showed me that you know before He can draw the firstborn out of us, the firstborn has to be formed in us. You know, and so I just, like, in reading just chapter 23, I just saw how much the firstborn had been formed in Abraham by this time. And so, you know, I just uh, looked up, like, Heth, just did a little word study, just because, you know, who are the sons of Heth, I was wondering. And, you know, it, it comes from a word that means broken, dismayed, dread, fear. So he just went to the sons of the crushed, you know, the, the dismayed. And it says that he bowed to them, you know. He's getting lower than that which was already considered low. And he's saying, man, let me, uh, let me buy this place so it can be a burial for my dead. And I just, uh, I just really just saw the spirit of the lamb in that. And, you know, they were like... And one of the things that really struck me is they looked at it and they said, you are a prince among us. You know, it's like they, all, they recognize that spirit as being the spirit of, of the living God, of the, true, of the true lamb. You know, it's like you are a prince among us. And, and you know, they were, they were definitely willing to give it to him for free, but, you know, a Abraham insisted and it actually uh, reminded me of that near the end of Second Samuel, when David came, uh, to, I, I forgot his name, but he, what? Ornan? <laughs> well, one, well, he was going to buy a place to to build that altar, so to make sacrifices unto the Lord, and the the guy recognized David. And he's like, "You're my king. <laughs> you don't have to buy this place. It's yours." But David said, I, I cannot just, there has to be a cost, you know. I have to lose something here. I can't just take it, take what's rightfully mine. You know, there, ha there has to be a cost. So I just, you know, see that, you know, compared to Abraham, the Abram playing tricks on the princes of these lands, saying, this is my sister, you know. You know, always, always trying to just avoid avoid death to just going into death and saying, hey, man, <laughs> I, the firstborn has been formed in me at this point, you know, I, I recognize it now and I'm, and I'm submitting to it. I'm submitting to that firstborn because I've tried everything before. I've tried escaping death. I've tried doing all that stuff. But in the end, this is where, this is where it ends <laughs> in, in death so that something can be brought forth so that's just what the, what the Spirit moved on me there. It's just reading that. It's like Abraham, he's totally different at this point. You know, he's not, he's not playing any, any more tricks. He's just totally submitted to that, to that Spirit. And so that, that's just what I saw. Well... I can assure you it'll get stronger even in this chapter and we'll, uh, he'll have plenty of uh, <clears throat> missteps yet to come, but absolutely, that's wonderful. Um, 
Let's see. Yeah, I had written here that it was it was the place, Hebron. The reason why I call it Hebron is I don't know if you're familiar with the Dallas area, but there, uh, Hebron is an area in North Dallas, and it is it was just nobody out there, and there was this road that just wound through, and there were hills and things. And do you kind of remember this, Jim? There was a there was a white church at the top of the hill, and it was about the only thing out there, and it had a graveyard, wow. you know, and it was, it was beautiful, just the setting and everything, but, I, and the name of the parkway to this day is, is Hebron, so that's where I kind of got it. It sounds to me more Jewish to say Hebron, but um, Hebron Parkway, and of course, my mind goes, why do we drive on a parkway and park on a driveway. But anyway, that's, <clears throat> I've never understood those things. All right, so, it, so to, to uh, identify that as their place that they called home in Genesis 35, if you want to turn there with me, and remember we're still in 13, so keep your place there, but Genesis 35 <clears throat> and verse 27, <clears throat> Excuse me, verses 27 through 29. And Jacob came unto Isaac, his father. Ooh, how's that sound? <laughs> this, these guys, these names mean so much to me now. Unto Mamre, unto the city of Arba, which is Hebron, where Abraham and Isaac sojourned. And the days of Isaac were a hundred and fourscore years, and Isaac gave up the ghost and died and was gathered unto his people, being old and full of days, and his sons Esau and Jacob buried him. <clears throat> so, that means fellowship, and you're familiar with these scriptures, so you don't have to turn there, but Philippians 3, of course, and verse 9 and 10 and be found in him, not having mine own righteousness. Well, just that right there is amazing because everyone who <clears throat> claims to be found in Christ, in Christ, they act as if they're righteous. I mean, the people that I see that do that, they, I want to be found in him so that I'll, you know, I'll be righteous instead of, he has made unto me righteousness, and I don't have that, and I'm not that. Um, at best, I am an earthen vessel of a great, great treasure. Um, so I love the beginning of that, and be found in him not having mine own righteousness. In other words, the first thought that comes to him about being in Christ is I am not righteous and I don't have my own righteousness. <clears throat> and it is liberating. It is liberating. But it liberates you from you too. <laughs> you know. um, <clears throat> which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. And if you'll notice, if, you, if he wants to be found in him not having his own righteousness, he doesn't want to also, in verse 10, he doesn't want to have uh, his own resurrection, but wants the power of his resurrection. He doesn't want um, uh, to fellowship with God over his sufferings. Let's fellowship in our sufferings. But he fellowships in his sufferings. And, um, and he doesn't want to be made conformable to his own death, but conformable unto Jesus' death, <clears throat> which is your death. But could, could we, could we ever get to a point where we don't have to talk about our death, but his death with an understanding that that did it all. But when we always, always, always are just saying, you know, my death, um, we're leaving out the fact that there was no my death without him. It was in his death. And he did the dying. I mean, if you, if you will, 
certainly outwardly, physically, emotionally. He did the dying. We just reckon on it, you know, in that sense. <clears throat> as far as the, the finished work death, if you will, if I can put it in that, that kind of words. Um, and here is used that word fellowship, uh, that I may know him. And he's talking about knowing him in a fellowship that is not based on the good times. Fellowship of his sufferings, conformable to his death. It is about being with him. It is about being with him in his worst times, if you will, his suffering. And some of you have heard the poem I wrote years ago called um, The Importance of Prayer, uh, which sounds such a generic title, but basically <laughs> it is, you know, because some people who go, oh, I'm not really into prayer. Well, that's what the poem's about. <laughs> you should have been into it instead of sleeping. But anyway, missing, missing eternal moments. Well, what are eternal moments? God. You know, I, you know, ooh, what are eternal moments passed by in that poem that we miss? They are the opportunity to be with him in his sufferings. We go, well, I missed eternal moments. What a great service, and I was sick or something. You know what I mean? Well, that's okay, too, but that's, you know, when we talk about fellowship here, you know, we're talking about, I mean, being made conformable to his death. Hebron fellowship, you're burying your dead there. There's a reality there. There's a greater reality there than just living there. And the reality is being with him in his death, being with him in his sufferings, being with him, the power of his resurrection, but it doesn't say resurrection power. You know, and it's often misquoted. Oh, I want, yeah, they'll read the scripture and they'll say, I want resurrection power. And that's a slap in his face. It's the power of his resurrection. Can anybody tell me what the power of his resurrection is? What? Okay. Or to the degree that you enter into the death is the degree of the resurrection, if you will. The power of resurrection is that you have gone into death in a right spirit <laughs> that's you know and of course we're not talking about physical death only you know in fact physical death would just be a manifestation of a reality of death but not the reality of the death by the lamb in other words, the death that Jesus died on that cross, it wasn't just his physical death. Yes, that was the ultimate, we call that the ultimate sacrifice. Ultimately, the, that, the ultimateness of that sacrifice is that he not just died for us, but he did it in a certain spirit. We call it the lamb spirit, but it was a certain spirit of, that, would, that would rather die and lose than to see all the people that are doing the worst things he, that he's ever had to him, that they would die and go to hell. Or that they would die in their own lives. Their own lives. How many of you want to die in your own life? Woo! No. Oh. Well, this is practice time. <laughs> This is practice time. We're getting opportunities every day to practice. All right. All right. So <clears throat> uh, I wrote, but concerning the seed that was uh, promised, due to old age, time was slipping away for Abram and Sarah, right? Mm -hmm. Time's getting away. I mean, you know, he can have all these journeys, and he can go down in Egypt and come out blessed, and he can, you know, have God speak to him over and over again. But really, and, and say that this, this land I would give unto you and to your seed. And he goes, but I don't have any seed. You know, 
Um, okay, so let's, let's try to put that in our, our story, not in this story. Any of you ever just sought the Lord and, Lord, I want more of you. I want a decrease of me, but I want an increase of you and therefore a decrease of me. Uh, and I want your life and I want your nature and I want that, uh, I would, I want that spontaneously out of me, not worked up or thought up or, you know, well, I think I should lay down my life in this situation, which is not the nature of the lamb to, I mean, it's, I guess it's better than going, well, I love Satan and I don't care what happens to y'all, but, you know, <laughs> but we're, you know, um, this you know, this thing of, of not having Christ formed in you the way that you know he is, is very grievous. And it's like, why is it taking so long? Anybody ever felt that way? Why is it taking so long? And every time I think I'm just about there, I go do something really stupid or whatever, or heinous or whatever. Doesn't matter, it's not Christ, that's the point. That's all, that's all that matters. And when we get to a place of knowing in a right spirit who he is and how he is, um, then when we see, especially if we go through a period where we just see a whole lot of us, it is so grievous. Well, that's what Abraham is going through. Where's the seed? Yeah. Where is the seed? I, you said, right? Anybody ever prayed that one? You said, and I am not seeing it, you know? And so, um, so in my opinion, this is one of the reasons why this whole story of Abraham and, and Sarah and the whole thing is so important because it is a, a process of the Lord bringing him to the place of not just the seed coming forth, but the seed eventually being willing, as it were, in him, with him, to go to the altar. Okay? So this is, we're not just studying history here. We're not just studying Jewish history, or we're not just studying Old Testament Bible story. We are seeking the Lord. We are uh, identifying in his story and saying, that's my story and I want out and it looks like you found the way. So, but, you know, as, as we've said, it's a, it's a journey. It is. I mean, this whole story, I mean, even though Hebron was kind of where they made their home, Abraham's still going all over the place. But he's going all over the place making altars and hear, hearing from God, you know. And the more we, you know, I mean, it's one thing to hear this stuff in a class and praise God for it because I thank God that I did. But I know that in many classes, I was not just hearing a man speak. The Spirit of God was getting me, was going, this is... This is what I'm at. This is what the Lord is at. This is what the Father wants. He wants his son. And it was just pressing me. And, and I remembered in my being crying out and saying, I need you. I, want, I still do that. What am I talking about? I do it regularly. I, I still need you, Lord. I want you. I want, uh, you know, because we, we talk about an increase of Christ. He must increase and I must decrease. Well, at what point does that end? You know, when you, when you walk around and you've got a halo over your head and everybody recognizes it, right? <laughs> no, no, it's, you know, I mean, that's, that's how in pictures from the great old artists would draw and they would say, you know, there's Jesus. He's the one with the halo. Well, Jesus didn't have a halo. And Jesus, they, you know, no matter what you say or what anybody else says, nowhere in there did it say he was very compassionate looking. His blue eyes pierced me. Most Jews didn't have blue eyes. Uh, you, know, all, you know, that kind of stuff. Just ridiculous. Um, it's not Jesus of Nazareth we want to know. 
we want to know the eternal son as he is in resurrection known as the firstborn in whom we dwell not having our own righteousness <laughs> amen because there's, there's no there is no glory in claiming to be in him while we while we rest in our own righteousness there's no righteousness imparted in that to us it's just imputed at that point that's imputed righteousness that's not imparted righteousness yet okay there's a there's a process i'm sure we dealt with that somewhere in the 87 years i've been teaching the word <laughs> what the righteousness series there you go imputed and imparted and and inputted. <laughs> right. All right. So, um, so that's where um, we can't we can't gather in a building to a Bible school or church and um, just go through the motions or we'll never get anything. I, it doesn't matter how much information flows into your head. You'll never really have anything. It comes when you come in here and in your heart you say, Lord, I'm here for you. Lord, I want your spirit to have his way in me in this class. And this is where you have to learn. If something hits you from the Lord during these times, Man, that, write that down and say, Lord, you know, right under it. Or, you know, I used to have a, when I was in Bible school, I had, I'd write stuff down, then I'd pull out my red pen and I'd circle it and, you know, put asterisks or big checks on it and says, you got to get this. Because I knew that was from God, even if I didn't understand what was said, which most of the time I didn't, you know. So, um, you know, those things are important. Those things are important to the progression. I mean, don't you believe that all those altars was Abraham crying out to God? But they weren't just going, oh, God, I need you. You know, out, down at a little front with a cushion, you know, a little kneeling cushion, you know. Oh, God, help me, help me, help me. You know, I mean, this is altars, you know. This is, this is death. This is the lamb, but not the lamb in me yet, but the lamb taking me to the altar. And a recognition that the true answer is not a progression of me. The, pro the true answer is a progression of the lamb in me to be formed to such a degree that... Um, much of my walk and my thought life and my attitudes are spontaneous lamb. Spontaneous lamb. You know. So, um, time was slipping away. The promise was that he will be the father of a great nation, but right now he's incapable of fathering anything. Right? All right. So, um, we might even assume that his um, demeanor before the sons of Heth, because the seed hadn't come forth yet, right? We might even assume that that's him learning at those altars or God speaking to him, but it's still external to him, so he's having to go, he's having to do things, but it's not life in him yet. Well, y'all understand that, don't you? You have to do that some. You do. You have to go, look, you know, he isn't, this isn't, I don't have the spirit of the lamb, but I'm going to do this because I know this is what he would do. Is that okay to do that? Yes, but not to deceive yourself as if that's the end game or something, you know. Um, and so... Uh, the reality is when you look at Abraham, you see a man trying to get hold of God. You see him building altars. You see him hearing from God. You see him different than any other man in that, 
in that, that area. But you also see a man incapable of bringing forth the seed yet. Incapable. All right. So what he will have to come to is not, I will keep meeting with God and I will get better and better. <laughs> he has to drop that kind of thinking. He has to go, eventually these altars need to take me down. <laughs> you know, eventually it must be the life of another. Eventually my desire is not the betterment of Randy Nussbaum. My desire is more of Jesus and less of Randy Nussbaum. And in truth, when the cross is fully revealed and you understand it, being made conformable to his death. So it's not even a decrease of you. Right? You know. I mean, you get to a point where you, you just, you're not going, Lord, I just want a decrease. I'm such a mess. And you get to a point where instead of that, you go, Lord, just kill me. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, the truth is, we're already crucified with Christ. Amen? We're already dead. But we need the reality of the one who brought us into that death by his way and spirit to live in us. Galatians 2.20, the life I now live in the flesh. I live it by that nature who loved me and gave himself. So I'm going to love him and give myself so that he can live. Amen. Uh, well, are you ready to venture into chapter 14? Okay. Chapter 14 is, um, is pretty much um, detailing a lot of war and stuff like that until you get to the very end of chapter 14, which will be one of the best chapters or best parts of Abraham that we will have gotten into thus far. Um, and I will tell you, maybe I, did I tell you all this, that I had, when in my initial searching, the Lord had dealt with me out of the prodigal son and began to show me this, <clears throat> and then he took me to Genesis, and he just, just in kind of like, like the, a universe, and you've got a curtain in front of you, and he just kind of went like this. He pulled it open like this. And I'm going, oh, God, what? You know? And he says, now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to feed that into you. But he gave me, like, the basic picture of Abraham all the way through and the spirit behind that, which was in, in miniature form, the prodigal son. And then he also gave me the whole story of Jacob and the incredible realities that are going to be, because all of this is, you know, he's the God of Abraham, Jacob, uh, Isaac, and Jacob, right? Yeah. And it takes all three of them. That's why they're all in one book, and the whole book basically is about that, you know, the vast majority of it. And then took me to Joseph and the same thing. But one of the funny things that he didn't do was, and as we got closer to chapter 14, I began to worry, uh, and I even had somebody ask me about it. Well, oh, man, I can't wait till we get to Melchizedek, you know? at the end of chapter 14, and I went, you know, God just didn't speak to me on that one. <laughs> and he really didn't at that time. And um, so I thought, well, you know, he knows what he's doing because I sure don't, and I, <laughs> I don't want to fake anything, and I don't want to reteach something, you know what I mean? And if he doesn't have anything to say about it, I don't want anything. But as I began to, you know, you have to sort of read ahead and prepare as you go then. Uh, a lot of times it's just organizing the thoughts that he gave you, but it's, it's real to you still because the life of it hits you. And that's, it, the reality isn't, you know, on paper or in your iPad or whatever. The reality is in you when it really, when the Lord does that. The reality is in you. And then you can organize letters and words. Um, but uh, a few days ago, I guess, maybe a week ago, he started uh, opening up about Melchizedek. <laughs> and um, it was the most amazing thing because he shared the whole story. You know the, 
most of you know the story of Melchizedek at the end of chapter 14. If you don't, you guys need to read it real well. <clears throat> but um, uh, you know that in the book of Hebrews, you know, and Melchizedek is this and that and that, and, you know, different, you know, all this, there's a lot of stuff written and everything in the New Testament, even in, <clears throat> when the Holy Spirit sh started sharing with me, basically he didn't even talk about Melchizedek hardly at all. <laughs> oh, he shared, he shared with me, and he shared incredibly with me, and blew me away. And I said, how can you take the story of Melchizedek and not talk about it? <laughs> but once we get into it, you'll see how he can do it. It's amazing. It's amazing. So there's this buildup, and it's an important buildup unto, unto that area. <clears throat> so let's begin in Genesis 14 and read verse 1 through 6. Uh, and it came to pass in the days of Amraphel, king of Shinar, Arioch, king of Elisar, Chedilomer, king of Elam, and Tidal, king of nations, that these made war with Bera, king of Sodom, and with Bersha, king of Gomorrah, Shinab, king of Adma, and Shemeber, king of Zeboam, and the king of Bela, which is Zor. All these were... Y'all should have clapped after that. <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure if those guys were alive in the room, they'd go. If you totally butchered our name. <laughs> um, all these were joined together in the Vale of Siddim, which is the Salt Sea. <clears throat> Twelve years they served Chedilomer, and in the thirteenth year they rebelled. And in the fourteenth year came Chedilomer and the kings that were with him, and smote the Rephims, and Astaroth, and Karna, Karnaim, and the Zuzims, and Ham, and the Enmis, and she Sheva, uh, Kirathaim, and the Horites in their mount, Seir, and El Paran, which is by the wilderness. <clears throat> All right. So w basically what we're getting out of that is what? Uh, let's see, war, uh, power, weapons, what? Weird names. Um, what? Domination and rebellion. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, because you, you've got, they rebelled, you've got smote. Okay. So um, uh, you're seeing, you know, war and control and someone trying to keep the upper hand or get the upper hand and tribute and things like that. But on the other hand, you're seeing that rebellion and you're seeing fight back and you're seeing regain control and show others that you are strong. Do, are you getting the picture? You're, you're getting someone over here is with their group is really strong and they control with an iron fist and they'll smite you if you don't do it right. But you got over here people that are weaker, but they're going, we're going to rebel because we're weaker. Does that sound right to y'all? No, we're not going to rebel because we're weaker. Well, okay, how about this? We're going to rebel because we're weaker but now we're stronger. Does that sound right? <laughs> no. It is, it is, it is the story of Melchizedek down there that needs to talk, needs to speak to us, needs to have God just, just intervene. Um, just amazing, praise God. But you've got, so, you, so neither side is right. Neither side is right. Okay, so that's their story. What about our story? Where do we fit into that? Are we controlling? Are we uh, rebelling? <laughs> Are we, you know, this and that? All those things that, that, that we could hear in the story, you know, of, of war and control and, you know, 
Um, war happens when two sides decide to fight over something, you know. And trying to get the upper hand and trying to um, push people down for their own purpose and good, gain. And then what we would call the nobler side, you know, the, um, uh, we, we might even say, I am, I am always for the underdog. Okay. <laughs> I'm, they're just as bad. Both of them lack the lamb. Both of them lack Christ being formed in them. And so all you've got is war going on in a huge section of Palestine and a bunch of names, but it doesn't matter what their name is. It's Adam and Adam, <laughs> the nature of the old man, the <clears throat> fallen creation, that which, that which fell from the presence of God and was driven out. Um, that which chose the knowledge of good and evil and still choosing it. Can I get a, oh me. Oh, me. <clears throat> still choosing it, still choosing to use these methods or these weapons, you know, and these guys have their weapons, right? The strong ones have their, but these guys have their weapons too and their weapons. And what do the prophets say? Well, we need to beat, beat them into plowshares, make them bring forth fruit to the glory of God and feed us instead of shed blood. And, you know, so um, uh, verse 7, <clears throat> and they returned and came to Imnispat, which is Kadesh or Kadesh, and smote all the country of the Amalekites and also the Amorites that dwelt in Hezez on Tamar. Hezez on Tamar. <clears throat> um, I found this verse interesting. I separated it from the larger group because this warring group that's controlling everything, they go to Kadesh, and they smite the Amalekites and the Amorites. Does that sound familiar to anybody? Or sound the opposite of someone else? Well, let me just read this since I'm getting a lot of blank stares. In this verse, this army goes to Kadesh and defeats the Amalekites and the Amorites. This is the same location and people groups that Israel faced when they got ready to enter the land and balk because of fear. In their eyes, they were as grasshoppers. Israel should have learned from Father Abraham that numbers and might cannot win against God's weapons. Yet Israel trembled. We see that here, and so I'm going to read the scripture. But uh, you, you do know coming up in this 14th chapter, Abraham's going to call his servants and they're going to go out and defeat this mighty army that's, that's defeating the, the uh, grasshopper stompers. <laughs> All right, so this is, and you can turn there with me, chapter 13 of Numbers. Numbers 13, of course, keeping your place in Genesis uh, 14. <clears throat> Numbers 13. And verse, starting with verse 17. <clears throat> and Moses sent them to spy out the land of Canaan and said unto them, Get ye up this way southward and go up into the mountain and see the land, what it is, and the people that dwell therein, whether they be strong or weak, few or many, and what the land is that they dwell in, whether it be good or bad, and what cities they be that they dwell in, whether in tents or in strongholds, and what the land is, whether it be fat or lean, whether there be wood therein or not. And be ye of good courage and bring of the fruit of the land. Now the time was the time of the first ripe grapes. So they went up and searched the land from the wilderness of Zin unto Rehob, 
as men come to Hamath. Okay, now let's uh, drop down to verse 27. <clears throat> 27. So this after they return from looking at the land. So they come back to report to Moses. And they told him and said, We came into the land whither thou sent us, and surely it floweth with milk and honey, and this is the fruit of it. Uh, nevertheless, the people be strong that dwell in the land, and the cities are walled and very great. And moreover, we saw the children of Anak there. The Amalekites dwell in the land of the south, and the Hittites, and the Jebusites, and the Amorites dwell in the mountains, and the Canaanites dwell by the sea, by the coast of Jordan. And Caleb stilled the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and possess it, for we are well able to overcome it. But the men that went up with him said, we are not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we, and they brought up an evil report of the land, which they had searched unto the children of Israel, saying, The land through which we have gone to search it is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof, and all the people that we saw in it are men of great stature, and there we saw the giants, the sons of Anak, which come of the giants, and we were in our own sight as grasshoppers, so we were in their sight. <clears throat> All right. So, you know, we, we have our, uh, we have our view. We all have our view. And my view makes sense because I see giants. <laughs> and they're real, you know. And, um, uh, you know, I remember during the charismatic movement, somebody sharing, and they were talking about uh, David and Goliath, and they said, uh, <clears throat> you know, that David went out, and uh, it's like uh, he um, he was just he just was saying in his mind, "There's no giant, there's no giant," and I'm sitting there going, "Yeah, you know, I think I was in my early 20s. I'm just going, what's the Bible saying?" <laughs> <laughs> you got a big old spear and you got all this stuff. It's no giant. Just just walk out there and just throw a rock and God will guide it and everything will be good. You know. <clears throat> and you know, I uh I learned that we can teach people our ideas on how to overcome <clears throat> it, whether it can be um that or whatever, but um, there are giants in the land here and there was a giant before David and he didn't say you're not a giant he said it doesn't matter because you're standing on God's ground you're claiming it trying to take it and yet you're an uncircumcised Philistine therefore you will be defeated and then he went to the stream and picked out a smooth, flat, wet river rock and he put it into his sling and he slung it and it went zing, pow, hit the giant and said, oh, because it hurt him. Anyway, he fell down and defeated him. Sorry, I'll go off into weird things sometimes. These giants that are in the land are every bit giants, but they are, they are nothing to God. And the Lord will regularly put you into situations where giants are bigger than you. Okay? He will. Your goal is not to be moved by the giants, but to stand with the Lord in his view and be with him and, uh, and, you know, I say this a lot, and I, don't, I really honestly don't know how much it gets over. When I say be with him, I mean, that's what you do. That's what you want to do. I want to be with you, Lord. I want to be with you in your spirit. I want to be with you in your way. I want your mind in me. And, um, and, but here's the, here's the secret behind it. It's not, the, uh, it's, not, it's not claiming or wanting certain things. The end, end of that sentence that I just said, I want to be with you, I want to, da, 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 or I want to have your mind, I want, is I, I want all that so I can be with you. 
I want to be with you. And this is the outline that you've given us to be with you. So my heart is not to overcome giants in me or giants out there. My heart is to be with you. And I, Father, I want that lamb spirit in me because that's what you love. That's who you are. And I can't, if you're lamb and I'm monster, <laughs> then I'm not with you no matter what I do, how much I pray or read or whatever. I'm not with you. All right. Again, like Abraham, we've all experienced not being with the Lord and then the agony of that and the hurt of that. Um, but the important thing is, is that if your heart still remains steadfast after it, that you go, I, I, cause I've had to say this to the Lord many times. I know I don't look like it, Lord, but I really do want to be with you. <laughs> you know, I don't seem to be really, you know, proving that. But I'm telling you, and I've said this, I, I'm, I'm, I'm asking you to not right now go by what I'm doing, but my words, I believe they're coming from my heart, but if they're not, just go by my words. I want to be with you. Amen. You say, I don't, I don't, you know, my prayers are not, oh, God, oh, almighty God. You know, I don't, you know, I just talk to him and I just tell him the way it is. I do. I just tell him, look, I'm, you know, I'm a mess, but you, that's, your, your son is the issue, not my, me being a mess. So I, even though I don't want that, I'm going to use that to continually show me where I'm not conformed and instead of letting it totally destroy me or let the devil speak to me and say you're just a hypocrite you know which I I loved in my earlier days when he used to say stuff like that to me well you're just a hypocrite because you want this but you won't act this way and I'd just say back to him I said well you're just a liar and the father of it so I'm not a hypocrite <laughs> <laughs> I don't think he liked that very much, but there's, you know, it's kind of hard. It's kind of hard to argue with because Jesus is the one who said that. You're a liar and the father of it. So, any, you know, that's why I still marvel to this day when people say, well, the devil said this and it really, you know, I, it's okay. I know y'all go ahead and say it. I'm fine with it, but I'm just saying it's just weird for me because, um, you know, he's a liar. I mean, you know. The day I'll worry is the day the devil comes to me and says, you're conformed to the image of Christ. Because he's a liar, so I'm going to go, well, that. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we need to stop. Yes, we, yes, we do. I need to stop. Amen. Y'all love Jesus? Amen. I'm telling you. We're going. We may be rattling along, but we're going. <laughs> Amen. We are. And the road's going to be bumpy, and the giants will appear every once in a while and everything, but we will reach our intended end because that's God's intention. And we, we need to not forget that it's God's intention, not ours. Even if we, even if we say, yes, I, that's my intention, stop thinking of it as your intention. Say it's God's intention, therefore it's going to happen. Because if it's your intention, you know that you're capable of losing that. So don't even worry about it. Don't even go there and say it's my intention. Just say this is your intention, I'm with you. Let's do it, Lord. Yes. Amen. Father, we just... We just, you know what, can we just stand up and just get in a big circle right here?
Before we pray, I'd like to welcome my friend Jennifer here tonight. <laughs> Good to have you. <clears throat> Father, we love you, and but, but our love for you is not really the thing that's going to keep us. But we do love you. We want to tell you that. But your love, your love for your son, Father, and you put your son in us. And these vehicles, because we grab the steering wheel every so often, are pretty beat up, but um, they'll still get us to you because your son's in us. And so we love you, and we're going <clears> to <throat> we're gonna trust in your heart for your son in relationship to us. And we're not just going to do that individually, but we're going to do that collectively, Father, that you have made us one with one another. And you not only did that spiritually, but in this group, you joined us. You brought us from afar in many cases and brought us together to this place, not for anything, not for all the whatever's wrong here or for whatever's right. None of the, that tree. You brought us here for the tree of life. You Thank brought you, us here you, to eat of your flesh and drink of your blood and to, to draw in more of you, uh, to fill up, to be filled up with all the fullness of God. That's what you said. And that only comes by Christ because we're complete in him. And you've settled what you've settled, you've settled. And what you're working on, you're still working on. So we, we put all that in your hands. We may not even be able to divide all that out, um, how it works or this or that. Father, it's not about making us geniuses or about making us omniscient. It's about our heart. We, we, we do want to be with you. We want it to manifest. We want it to make you happy because it's your son in us. That is, it's the fellowship between you and your son. Truly, it is the fellowship between you and your son. Thank you, Lord. And so, Father, we stand together. Our prayer is not just over ourselves individually as we hear this, but is over us as a, as a group, a covering, a, a covering over us even now as we say we, we love you, we want you, we need you. And by your love and by your gracious nature, not by your grace, but by your gracious nature, we shall come into every ounce of what you have in your heart to come to pass. Thank you. Thank you now as if it were all completely done. Thank you, thank you, thank you. We do thank you. And we do have hearts of gratitude in the smallest and the greatest, Father, in the least and in the thing that seems most important. We are thankful and grateful for all that comes by your hand. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Well, hug about four people and we can go. One, two, three, four. I did four. Good. No more hugs. <laughs> so my kids are loud. I did four dishes. <laughs> Aren't you going to do that?